Assume the party escort submission position or you will miss the party. Welcome back to The Short Game. This is the show where we talk about short games, the kind of games that you can pick up and really enjoy and actually have time to complete, games that you can fit into your schedule. This is actually a really special episode of The Short Game, because this is, first of all, it's our 10th episode, uh, so that's exciting. 10 episodes. That's, that's more episodes than I ever thought we would, we would complete. Here we go. You have no faith in us, Shane. No faith. Well, we will not complete this one. That's true. This week, I am joined by Shane Kelly. Unfortunately, Nate Heininger can't be with us tonight. So, he's at a wedding. No, actually, he's kind of at the opposite of a wedding. Oh, well, let's cut that part out. Yeah, he's at a funeral. Oh, I'm sorry. I got confused. Yeah. So, yeah, sadly, Nate Heininger cannot be with us tonight. He's with us in spirit as we discuss one of the most incredible short his spirit games. is here is it his funeral it's not it's not his funeral and it's not his spirit as such he's he is with us in he's he's just he's just not here all he's right not he's, here. he's not he's not here okay and he's somewhere else out there not here and tonight uh we shane and i are discussing portal which is such an important game in the type of games that this show is about portal is one of my favorite games of all time, an absolutely hugely influential game. And in some Would ways, you say I this think, game is seminal? I don't like that word, but yes, we'll go with seminal. You don't like the word seminal. Okay, fine. Before we dig in too deeply to talk about Portal, though, um, Shane, what are you up to lately? I've got my mouth full of Oreo. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> we have to cut a lot right out here at the I, start, aren't we? <laughs> no, oh. all right, Oreos are delicious. Mm. All right. Mm. I'm going to swallow, but I got a whole another half of Oreo right here. So, um, Jesus, Shane, we can't eat during the podcast. It's not allowed. I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, what am I up to? I am looking forward to, by the time you're hearing this, you will already know the answer to the mystery in my mind right now. Uh, yes, we're recording I, this the weekend before E3. So you, listener, are in the future. How's it going in the future, listener? Did they finally announce a release date for The Last Guardian? Probably not, if the track record is... Yeah, give it up, Shane. Uh, so, um, one of my first games that really made me realize how artistic gaming could be and how moving it could be uh, was Eco, um, And that game made a profound impression on me. And... Of course, the uh, the follow up um, to that game, um, Shadow of the Colossus, made an even more lasting impression on me. And then uh, in two thousand and nine, the trailer, also at E three for The Last Guardian, uh, made also a, a profound impression on me. And every <laughs> year since then, I have been waiting. And every year, as we lead up to E three. Uh, there's some kind of rumor about this game. Things are are rumbling, and those rumors are back. And I'm not even gonna go into what was said by who, but you know, some guy at Sony said, "Yes, we're still working on it." Amazon put a page up for it. The page may or may not still be up. Well, we'll see. You know, it's been almost seven years since they announced this. <laughs> the so, Last Guardian. It's it's probably the most hotly anticipated piece of vaporware I can remember. It's not vaporware. It's there, man. The guy from Sony said. <laughs> but uh, what that made me think of was another piece of news uh, this week, which was how Steam has had to kind of change their positioning on their early access games, where they're saying, hey, um, you know, 
only buy these games if you're interested in playing it in its current state because it may never come out. And so I just wanted to kind of see if if you had a, an opinion on that, Reagan. What, what do you think? Is that just sort of the world we live in now where, you know, if you want to play a game, you have to kickstart it and then just hope for the best? Yeah, we've talked about this sort of on our episode about Broken Age because that's another example of a um, early access game or a game that uh, comes out in a partially formed version and hopefully someday has a full final release. And I think that all this kind of comes out of the incredible success of Minecraft, which you know started as a beta, but you could sign up for it as a beta, and it spent most of its hugely successful life as a beta. People loved playing that game in its beta form. And sort of like how Gmail was in beta for a hundred years. Yeah. Well, you know, I like that about Minecraft because uh, you know, you get in there and they're always adding new content to the game. And that's a beautiful thing when the game is growing in a dialogue between the fans and the creators. And that's an amazing thing. So, uh, but there's also the sort of feeling that I may not like this game when it's complete or this game may never be complete. Yeah. If, if I had been able to throw money at the last guardian back in 2009, I would have just emptied my, my wallet. I don't even know if I had a PayPal account or anything back then, but if I had, I would have just sort of spewed my hard earned like sandwich shop dollars at them. And, um, and they'd still be sitting on all of those dollars and you would all have no those game. digital dollars. They would just be sitting on them. So I don't know what I would prefer, you know, in my dream world. Like if I can come up with the the successful uh, business models for the gaming industry, you know, do I prefer to, you know, have these vaporware games announced and then just disappear and fizzle? Or, or would I prefer to have the games released in some unfinished form and I get to play them and then ultimately, you know, pay in real world dollars for my disappointment i don't i don't know it's really hard i think that a game like uh like minecraft succeeded in that because it was already fun what i think we're seeing is some games coming out in these early access forms where they're entirely too incomplete you know the the developers uh ha talk a big game of oh this is great it's going to allow us to to involve our fans in the development of the game I don't understand. Um, I don't understand how someone becomes a fan of something so incomplete. I certainly I like to look at something and see the promise in it, but I, I try to be very careful about my early access or Kickstarter or otherwise sort of pre-purchasing before a game is completed um, play because I don't like to. What have you actually kickstarted or pre-purchased? Not very many games. Um, the two that spring to mind would be that I uh, I Kickstarter backered uh, Broken Age uh, and also um, oh geez, what's the name of that Viking uh, game? The Banner Saga. The Banner Saga. I was just so impressed with the visual style of the game that I backed it on Kickstarter. And fortunately, even though it did take quite a while for that to come out, it came out in great form. The game was really complete when it was finally released. They did do some kind of unusual things with it. Like, for example, um, I think in order to kind of continue the enthusiasm for the game and also to kind of make sure that it was still on people's radar, but also I think to get some new money into their, into their development budget, they released it in part as a sort of a multiplayer version without the campaign. Uh, and they released that over a year, I think, before the full game came out. I think that's another kind of interesting tack that these types of things can do. If you're creating a game that has the possibility of coming out in sort of multiple forms rather than coming out in a crummy form and then getting better later, you know, releasing a great little part of the game. Another example of that is the dogfighting part of Star Citizen that just came out. Star Citizen is a huge game. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of really great content to it, apparently, we think. Yeah, I hadn't heard about this game until our, our guest appearance, uh, you and I. Oh, you hadn't heard about Star Citizen? No, I hadn't. It was a huge... Uh, it's. But uh, we should mention, um, 
our guest appearance on Casual Shenanigans. Yes, which you'll... Hey, guys, it was <laughs> awesome appearing with you. I wonder if you're listening or not. But if you are, hey, thanks so much for having us on your show. Yeah, was that totally was a lot cool. of fun. And uh, if you want to check that out, uh, we'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, we'll also have tweeted about it long ago by the time this episode is released. But uh, we were on episode 51 of Casual Shenanigans, another great podcast, mostly about PC gaming. And they were really great. They were really gracious hosts. And we had a great time chatting about um, you know pre-E3... Uh, talk and and know. terrible sega accessories yeah interesting stuff so yeah i think that's a really good point shane about the early access games i'm so conflicted about it and i think all of gaming is i think that's why you're seeing this kind of conversation around steam early access and then making sure that people know what they're getting into when they buy these types of games because sometimes that turns out amazingly and other times it kind of doesn't and Maybe that's good. Maybe it's not. I, I hate to equivocate, but I'm really of two minds about it. Yeah, there's um, it, it's sort of like the old saying of you don't want to see how the sausage gets made. Well, you also don't want to kickstart pre-release sausage. Yeah, it might be gross sausage. Yeah. What if you what if you actually had a Kickstarter for sausage and one of the one of the bonuses was to get to see how the sausage got made and then you got grossed out. <laughs> I don't think you could get a refund. <laughs> I kickstarted that um, Veronica Mars movie and I didn't even watch it yet. Really? I did too and I watched it day one. I was really excited. Uh, how was it? It was pretty good. It was basically an extended episode of the TV show, but I loved the TV show and uh, it really tied up some of the characters' arcs in a way that I found pretty you know, yeah, fun. I was saying I, I was saying I was going to go back and rewatch the show before I watched the uh, the movie. I rewatched some of season two. That's pretty much all I needed. Yeah. OK, well, we'll probably cut all this because nobody on this show is going to care about Veronica Mars. And if they uh, do, they probably know. have their own podcast. <laughs> I'm sure there's a dozen Veronica Mars podcasts out there that you can check out. So, yeah, um, I guess um, I haven't had that much time to be gaming lately, and I know you're in, in mid-move, but you basically always make time for gaming, so... <laughs> why, why don't you make me sound like a loser? You are not a loser. You have, you were, you, I called you earlier, and you said, I can't talk now. I'm out with friends, and I was like, whoa, whoa, this guy's got friends, but... <laughs> um, so what are you playing lately? Uh, well, well, the, the last game that I downloaded... Um, and it's not exactly new news, but it's a pretty new game, uh, is uh, Transistor, which is a sort of spiritual sequel to or, um, you know, just new game from the company that brought you Bastion. I know that you uh, and I both really liked Bastion. Yeah, I really did. And, and it was a definitely a unique game. You guys did an episode. Unfortunately, I wasn't there for it. But the episode on Thomas was alone. And I think Bastion is... Similar in, to Thomas was alone in that it takes a lot of tropes from a casual, from a not a casual, from a uh, from a common genre, kind of uh, a retro and, genre, yeah. but it and really it, transforms and it. it. And yeah, it, and it does that through great narrative storytelling by uh, providing constant feedback from a, a excellent narrator. And so I know that this game is also a narrated game. It shares a lot in common with uh, Bastion. It does and it doesn't. It's really, really cool. So first off, it still has this beautiful painterly art style, but it's definitely different from Bastion. So for those of you who might not have gotten a chance to see the trailer, and of course we'll include one in the show notes, um, uh, Transistor is a top-down uh, first, excuse me, it's a top-down role-playing game, sort of an action role-playing game. Uh, where you're playing as a woman named Red in a fantasy science fiction sorry, cyberpunk esque kind of city called uh, Cloud Bank. Cloud Bank. Cloud Bank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I've watched and, some of the trailers and things like this, and, and they. You're right. The game looks so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It looks like a uh, like a Klimt painting. It's very Art Deco. They play off the fact that she's a she's a singer, so you've got a musical element to the game. And you've got a talking um, and, sword, the transistor, that narrates the game. that's the narrator, yeah. So so that's fun because the the narrator is the character that's always there with you. This is kind of 
kind of a video game trope that I'm not always a fan of, which is the um, quiet main character who has a talking blank, you know, uh, whether it's like a Jack and Daxter, he has a talking marmot mm-hmm. or. Uh, hey, listen. Hey, listen, I'm the fairy that follows you around and explains things. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this game, is it being done pretty well? I'm liking it a lot. Yeah. Does the main character have a personality, you know, outside of the fact that she carries a talking sword? Somewhat. I will say that I am pretty early in the game. And also, we don't need to go into too much detail because hopefully we're going to be doing an episode on this game pretty soon. Uh, I'm really enthusiastic about what I've seen so far, and I'm pretty confident that this would be one that would be great for our show. So uh, once I get a little farther into it, I'm hoping that this will be one we'll be able to bring more detail to you. Uh, But yeah, it's a great game. I'm enjoying the combat which is a sort of a cool mix of action and turn-based. Uh, as you're playing at any point, you can pause the action and plan out several actions, and like you know, several uh, moves or attacks, uh, and then turn that pause mechanic back off, and all of those play out very quickly, and then you can play kind in real time a little bit. Kind of type, a uh, FTL type thing going on. Almost, but actually the pausing mechanic is more a sort of... Uh, ability because your ability to pause the action sort of slowly recharges once you unpause so uh also it's got a really neat upgrade mechanic for your weapons and your you know attacks i'm just really liking everything about it i I saw that like as you get damaged you lose a lot of the abilities that you've taken on so instead of just dying you have to play through the rest of the fight but with fewer special abilities. Yeah, and that's actually a pretty good way to compromise because uh, I don't really like games where you have to play the same fight a hundred times. In this, I usually can limp my way through a fight, uh, but I'll often, if I'm doing particularly badly, restart the fight, which they make really easy to do, to try to make sure that I keep all my cool abilities throughout. I I could see that being cool, though, as a way to sort of force you to use a different strategy. That's true, because it usually, I think, is uh, killing off your most frequently used abilities first. Or maybe I'm misreading that, but it seems to be for me. Anyway, awesome game. I'm really, really liking it. Hopefully we'll be bringing more about it to you soon. Uh, But if you haven't checked it out, it is uh, $19.99. It's on Steam, uh, Windows only at the moment, but the developers have announced that it is a game that they're planning on bringing to other platforms like they did with Bastion. So uh, Bastion, they first brought it out on Windows only, then it came out on Mac and Linux, and later they even brought Bastion out on iOS, although that was much, much later. Um, I'm hoping for a similar trajectory with uh, Transistor to allow as many people to play it as possible, but it's already available on Windows and also on the PS4, which is neat. Oh, I would love for it to hit iOS uh, a little faster, this time around uh, because that's the way that I played Bastion was uh, on iOS on my iPad. How did you like it? I liked it pretty well. Um, It was one of those games where they um, managed to kind of hybridize between sort of on-screen controls and like tap and drag style controls, uh, you know, touch screen controls. Uh, it was the kind of thing I wasn't sure would work well on iOS, but it worked out pretty pretty nicely. So Yeah, that's one of those games that I didn't even try playing it on iOS, but actually everyone I've talked to who has played it on iOS said that it was a lot of fun and that uh, having just experimented with it a little bit on a friend's iPad, they really changed the way the game plays. Uh, you know, rather than just sort of trying to take the D-pad or the buttons that you would have had on a gamepad and put them onto a screen, they really kind of reimagined it into a more swiping and sort of dragging style mechanic that actually worked really well. I was really surprised. Anyhow, um, what's our topic for this week? Right, we are talking about Portal. And this is such an amazing game that I'm really glad that it came in on our 10th episode because I I think this game deserves a kind of a special place in our podcast. Uh, Portal, I So is this the the short game, the games that came out years ago edition? 
Kind of. I'm pretty confident that Portal is a game that essentially every one of our listeners will probably already have played. Now, if you didn't play Portal, what are you even doing on this show? What are you doing? If you haven't played Portal, you should go and download it on your computer because it will run on a potato and uh, you should play it right away. It's an amazing, amazing game. Um, I have actually recently been replaying it in a new form. That's kind of interesting. It came out recently on the NVIDIA Shield, uh, which is fascinating because it's the first time any source-based games, any games from Valve, have been ported to a handheld. Really a, an amazing uh, feat because it runs beautifully. But it will run on uh, Mac, Windows, or Linux, and you should absolutely play it. So I'm going to actually, this is <sighs> crazy. Um, let's go ahead and fire off the spoiler break right here. If you haven't played Portal, what are you doing? Go play Portal. It's amazing. Here's the spoiler break. Great. This was a triumph. (laughs) So, first of all, I don't think Portal really requires a lot of explanation. We will talk about its mechanics and what makes them so amazing, and we'll talk a little bit about its story, uh, such as it is. Um, But I kind of wanted to start by just talking a little bit about thinking back to before Portal came out. You know, dive your mind way back to before 2007, before October 2007, when this game came out. What were you doing in 2007, man? I Did I even, like, I think I had just gotten an iPhone yeah. for the first time. Yeah, somewhere around there. I was playing some, like, iPhone games. No, wait, you couldn't have, because we didn't get the first iPhone, and the first iPhone came out in 2007. Okay. So that tells you how good, I, how well I remember 2007. Yeah. Not very well. Not very well. Well, here's what I remember w- about the first time that I heard about Portal. I'd heard the name a couple of times, but all I knew about Valve as a company was that they were the company that made Half-Life. And at that time, I had still never even played Half-Life. So um, I have still never really played Half-Life. Yeah, we're not talking about that. I don't, it's a sticking point between you oh and me. Oh, God, it's so awful, Shane. You, uh, but I'd still never really played Half-Life at the time. And then I was on the web someplace, and someone kindly pointed me towards the... I was probably on Google Reader. I did a lot of Google Reader back then. And I saw the trailer, the original teaser trailer for Portal. Four out of 40 for Google Reader. Oh, poor Google Reader. Fortunately, we've moved on. But... Uh, the the original trailer for Portal was unlike anything that I'd ever seen. When you watch that trailer, it begins with uh, the computer voice. Uh, we didn't know her name yet. We didn't know anything about GLaDOS. So all we thought was, this is a, you know, computer voice announcing uh, that you're watching a training video, an orientation video for employees of Aperture Science. And the video was done in the style of little kind of uh, iconic cutout people in an isometric kind of uh, room. Uh, Very abstract. And what's great about this trailer is, you know, I'm I'm rewatching it, and what is great about it is it explains the game in basically all the detail you need. Absolutely. You watch this trailer for one minute, and you've had your employee, um, uh, what's the word, Uh, orientation. You know how a portal gun works. So in a very abstract form, it shows you little little jumpy person fires one portal at one wall, fires a portal at the other wall, and walks through one portal out the other somewhere else across the room. And immediately I was thinking, that is an amazing mechanic because it defies physics, and I've never seen a game that had working... So many games were just at that time trying to even basically simulate physics in a reliable way. And this was a game where not only was it simulating it well, but you were tweaking it and playing with it, playing with, you know, direction and gravity Mm -hmm. in ways that I had never even thought about doing before. Yeah. And as the, as the trailer progresses, you see this little, you know, jumpy iconic person, uh, perform a couple of other very, very basic portal mechanics. Um, And then it cuts to in-game footage of the same room that you are seeing that little jumpy, iconic person in um, as the charming computer voice describes what you'll be doing as an employee 
then suddenly you see not only does this room have the little gap that you have to get across, it's not so friendly as that. There are spikes descending from the ceiling above you. There is a vicious looking poison in the bottom of that trough. And you immediately pick up on the black humor of the game as well, because you can see, oh, not only am I trying to solve this basic physics puzzle, but the computer is tormenting me while I do it in a very charming way. It instantly gives you a, a yes. sense of the black humor that you're going to be getting in the game within the first moment of this very short trailer. And it proceeds through a few more very, very simple portal puzzles, seeing them both as sort of an iconic design. So you get a sense of what am I actually seeing? You get a bird's eye view with the mm -hmm. with that view. And then you get the first person perspective as you yeah, see that portal. I think that's an completed. effective way to explain the game because as the first in the first person perspective in a game that is playing with physics in new ways that you've never seen before like giving it to you as like a flat diagram is a very effective way and i will say actually just this is sparking my memory that pretty quickly um people had put together online portal inspired flash games that were like i remember one that was two dimensional i i, I wonder if i'll be able to find it these days and maybe include a link in the show notes or something. But um, that was actually my first experience with the game was some portal inspired uh, online game mm -hmm. content. I remember one called ASCII portal. That was like ASCII portal okay. graphics of a net hack type game. <laughs> okay. But you know, this was, this was sort of like when you've got it, when you've got something really new or at least something that was new to 90% of the people that were seeing it, um, it's that inspirational that everybody wants to imitate it. And there was a whole barrage of imitators. Not with um, exactly the same mechanic because it still stands alone as a really unique game. But you're right. There were a lot of physics based puzzles that sort of seemed to grow out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, when, as you continue through that trailer, um, you, you, it, it, it eventually drops the, iconic uh you know orientation video look and suddenly you're seeing just rapid fire moment after moment after moment of increasingly complex and bizarre effects of the portal physics you see something falling back and forth falling up and then falling down falling up falling down you see the moment when you know a uh, when chell uh, the character who you play in Portal sees herself through the portals. You see the moment when she begins falling through an endless set of portals with one in the ceiling and one in the floor, giving her infinite momentum. You see flings like she'll be performing later in the game. So you get a sense of all of the bizarre physics that you'll see in the game. And you also see some of the things like the really cute turrets. Turrets, turrets the turrets, which are one of my favorite elements of the game. I'm sitting here staring at a little toy turret on my desk right now. Um, so you really get a great sense of the humor of the game and the mechanics of the game all in this tiny short trailer. And it absolutely blew my mind when I saw it because I immediately thought, you can't do that in a video game. How is that going to work? How could that possibly work? And then it shows you it working. I had a limited understanding of like the programming of video games at that time, but I was like, wouldn't you have to just sort of like draw two whole copies of the room every time you do it. And like, how can you, how can you create a game engine that supports like bending of space back on itself in impossible ways that this is going to require? Yeah. Uh, but I, I guess that's what video games let you do is like achieve the impossible. Yeah, and absolutely. That's, you could see immediately right away that this was a game that was going to give you something you'd never seen before. Right. So that trailer is really firmly in my mind is one of the most amazing video game trailers that I've ever seen. And it was still a little bit of time after seeing that trailer before I got to play the game, but the buzz was there. Uh, the game came out in October, 2007. Um, I didn't get a chance to play it until a little bit later because it was several months before it came out on the PS3. And at the time that was my main game system. Um, uh, but to kind of recap where that game actually comes from, uh, Shane, did you ever get a chance to see Narbacular Drop, the game that Not Portal became, came out of? Not until after I had played Portal. So I know that Narbacular Drop was kind of a student project that someone created, and then it was sort of brought 
on board at, at Valve, is that right? Yeah. Like they hired them or something? Yeah, it was a team. Actually, it kind of reminds me a little bit of what we've heard about with um, uh, with the Octodad team, Young Horses, although this was pre-Kickstarter. So there was no place for a bunch of bright young students with an amazing game concept to go to get funding for themselves. So A great game concept with a terrible name. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's kind of weird. So Narbacular Drop was the game that predates Portal. Uh, it's a game where you play as Princess Noni's, uh, so-called because she can't jump. Princess Noni's is trapped in a castle or tower or labyrinth uh, by some sort of demon, and she has to escape. And she's only able to escape using a magic wand that throws portals. Uh, a lot of what would later become Portal itself really grew out of this original game. Uh, it was just created by a bunch of students at DigiPen, which is like a uh, programming, I don't know. Do you know anything about DigiPen? I know the name and that's it. Never mind. Is it a digital pen? <laughs> I assume. Um, DigiPen students put this game together as a, as a student project. It won some awards um, and Valve saw the game and hired more or less the entire team that created it. Uh, and it took them several years, but having brought that entire team inside Valve, uh, they started work on Portal, uh, the game that would you know, kind of bring that great concept to a wider audience. But it was still a pretty small team. It was a team of just about 10 people. And so they weren't given the kind of resources that you would need to create a really top tier uh, extremely successful game. Uh, Valve didn't really know what they had their hands on yet. And so they kind of hedged their bets. They kept the team small. They kept the scope and, sh and length of the game short. Uh, thanks, Valve, there. And uh, they also put some really interesting limitations on it that led to some of the design decisions that make the game so, I think, really popular today. Um, the biggest one was because it was so short on money, uh, because they didn't have a big budget, they decided to save money on art assets by reusing a lot of the art assets from Half-Life 2. This was at a time when Half-Life 2 was still in development. They would totally have just kickstarted it today. I know, they just kickstart it and we would have Narbacular drop the extended edition or something like that, which would probably be great, but I'm really glad things went down the way they did. Uh, I don't think I would have liked it as much if it was Princess Noni's in Narbacular drop Ultimate Edition. I, I mean, like, look, looking at it, like the narbacular catch. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not, I'm not gonna be like trashing on him, but I just just not as comp as compelling when you've got like a magic portal that looks like a giant, you know, monster cat face. Have you seen the? I'm just looking at the one or two images I've ever seen of narbacular drop. Like the portals themselves look like giant gaping mouths yeah now it has the color scheme already they're orange and blue the orange the same and blue. as they yeah, would be so in the that. later game but yeah it had some things in common but it also had some serious differences one big one that i i and i've actually not played narbacular drop but having seen a little video of it one really big can difference you? sorry can you play narbacular drop anywhere that's a good question i don't know if it's available anywhere I never tried. Anyway, Narbacular Drop had one really key difference in terms of the puzzles, which was that you could fire portals through portals. Um, that's not possible in Portal. Uh, if you fling a portal through a portal, it collides with the wall and you get nothing. But if you, in Narbacular Drop, you could shoot a portal through a portal to kind of extend your reach. I'm kind of glad they restricted that though because i can think of a number of places in 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 portal itself where having that ability would have made certain puzzles way simpler but also less interesting well let's talk about um let's talk about specifically portal let's not get too far down the narbacular let's not drop too far in in, in the narbacular direction sure what what on earth is narbac a narbacule by the way i mean <laughs> okay stop all right turn back now yes i know you just replayed portal I did on your Nvidia Shield. Uh -huh. What was it like to come back to that game after how many years has it been? It had been a few years. I think the last time that I played it, from not counting Portal Two, the absolutely excellent sequel, which builds on the game and is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, I think the last time that I played Portal was just before Portal Two came out. Um, so it's been quite a while. Um, going back to it and playing it again from the beginning. I still remembered essentially how to solve all of the puzzles. 
And I thought that that would diminish my enjoyment of the game, but no, it really is just sort of mechanically fun to use the portal gun. You know, going back to those levels and even playing the ones where it's like, oh, this is, you know, this is uh, easy as, what's the word? This is easy as pie. Easy as pie. This is easy as pie, but it is still super fun to use that portal gun. I remember there was a level, uh, there's a level about halfway through the initial part of the game where you have to uh, go up through a very, very tall room. And the only way to get up high enough is to kind of fall down through a portal and up through another and then change that portal location just at the peak of your arc, fall back down and fall up through the next location of the portal, um, shoot another portal at the peak of your arc, and you really have to fall up and down, sort of essentially bouncing through these portals uh, five or six times to get from the, the ground floor up to this very high point. And I remember dying so many times during that part because I just qu couldn't quite make it happen. Um, there's a, you know, the, the toxic floor below you. And if you miss even just one of them, then you're screwed and you have to start over. But this time I did it on the first try, uh, probably because I've had a lot of practice playing this game and Portal 2, uh, but also just because I think there's something about this game that's like riding a bike. Even though I was easily able to pick it up and get right back into it, it is mechanically fun to do. It is just a super fun game to play. Absolutely. I think it's in that way, like certain games you can always go back to. And for me... One of those is the original Mario games. Like, you know, you go back and, and replay that game. You're not having to relearn anything. Uh, and that's a game where things are super, nat you know, not supernatural. They are very natural from the beginning. Uh, you know, just jump and use your D-pad. Uh, but in this game, it's su surprisingly natural to the point where when I went back to replay it not too long ago... Um, in those initial levels where they're sort of doling out the explanation to you, you know, where they're slowly explaining to you how the portal gun works and giving you first, uh, I think the, the blue portal and then the orange portal mm -hmm. up until the point where they had given me both of the portals, it was just torture. You know, <laughs> I felt hobbled. Um, I, I fortunately I you can make so it through natural. that all very quickly. So yeah, you can. I got back into the meat of the game pretty quickly and was really enjoying myself. They do a great job of explaining things to you as you as you go through. Like, um, I I remember the part where, for the first time, they're taking you through the idea of that you can sort of accelerate by falling through a portal and uh, having Gladys there to explain things to you. I remember the first time uh, was extremely helpful. You know, she just talking about conservation of momentum and all this blah 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 and then she says speedy thing goes in speedy thing comes out and i was like oh i get it of course it helps right she is very very helpful in those initial levels and that's something that i didn't remember about the game going back to it after so long uh having played portal 2 more recently uh, you know, and really having a good idea of, you know, who is GLaDOS? What is she all about? Going back to it, it really made me remember the first time I played through that game. Uh, you don't know much about who GLaDOS is or what her motivations are. And she really seems at first just like an automated recording. You know, something that's just there that plays every time a test subject goes through this room. You don't think that you are really having a dialogue with her at first. You think this is just the equivalent of an exit sign on the wall that talks. But the farther you get into the game, you get that wonderful discovery that she's talking to you and she's responding to what you do not just um not just sort of playing you pre-recorded messages and then once you get past that sort of middle point in the game where you really are suddenly working against her you sort of escape her her scheme then her whole tone changes and suddenly yeah. she's no longer just sort of uh playing you recorded messages uh and having a sort of a smug nature about you know, telling you what she wants to tell you. It suddenly becomes she, it's clear that she's actually not just a recording. She is a sadistic 
and bored computer who is using you for her amusement. Uh, right after you begin to escape, she actually starts addressing you as you or speaking directly to you. And she starts talking about I, herself, rather than speaking more in the third person, you know, we, Aperture Science. So you get a sense that finally I've seen her true face. She is a sadist and I have to escape her and, and, and take her down. Really the greatest villain. Mm -hmm. And those were some really shocking moments to me in the game where you start to find... Um, the sort of holes in the wall where, you know, previous test subjects have crawled their way out or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things scrawled on the backs of, you know, pried open panels, mm -hmm. you know, where someone's been staying and living. It's the quote it's, unquote um, rat man who you uh, never yes. see in the game and not even in Portal 2 either, but who, whose presence is felt someone who came before mm -hmm. you. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't really I know that come, you know, the details on that character came from some sort of outside the game yeah there's like a comic book that they published yeah. on their website there's actually quite a bit of lore to the game and that's something kind of interesting about it um the game takes place in the half-life universe and initially that was just out of requirement of well if we're going to use all these half-life art assets why not just set it in the half-life universe and it ties it into their larger you know uh uh world of half-life one half-life two um well, it might just be me but this game has sort of really grown wings that are larger than just the half-life universe i think it's a although as as popular as half-life is i wonder how many people have played this uh, versus how many people have played all the half-life games that's kind of true half-life is a big deal uh, but i do think that this game had a lot of cultural relevance on the internet for quite a while um i'd say that it's it's easy to say that maybe this game is bigger for Valve than Half Life is. You, you still, I mean, on the internet especially, you're right. You still sometimes see memes about the cake is a lie. Yeah, this game was everywhere for a few years, and then again when Portal Two came out, it it was everywhere. Um, so its connection to Half Life is important because I think it it gave the game a sense of something outside of this tiny facility. You know, it gave you a, a feeling that there was more to this than met the eye, but uh, it, it's not super important to the game that you have played Half-Life. It's really more that the Half-Life references in the game are there as an Easter egg for people who love Half-Life. Um, but to connect it to the Half-Life games, if you are a Half-Life fan, this game essentially takes place, I think somewhere between the events of Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2. So the reason that after you know, GLaDOS uh, takes over the facility and pretty much exterminates all of the people who work there, uh, the reason that nothing was ever done about that is, oh, hey, there was an alien invasion during that time, and everyone was kind of busy upstairs. So really, you also see kind of the competition between Aperture Science, the company that runs this facility, and Black Mesa, the company that is hugely important in the plot of the Half-Life games. I think it's a really brilliant choice that they made to tie these two games together because I think a rising tide lifts all boats and all of these games are more important because of it. So my first experience with this game in actually playing it was when you handed down to me your used copy of the orange box for PlayStation 3. And um, I, I got to confess, it was the only game in the orange box that I played all the way through. I started, um, I started Half-Life 2 Episode 2 and... I, I played. Do you, do you mean you started Half Life Two Episode Two before you played Half Life Two or Half Life Two Episode One? Was Half Life Two Episode Two in the orange box, but not Half Life Two Episode One? It, so ha the entire Half Life Two saga was in okay. the orange no, box. No, so I, st I I did start it. I I uh, so just to uh, 
this is going to start a war between oh, you and me I know, again. It really we, is. I thought we had buried, but I started Half-Life 2. Um, I have memories of playing Half-Life 1 partially uh, way back in the day. Uh, all I remember from the game was wandering around in unmarked corridors and being licked by weird barnacle creatures on the ceiling. <laughs> um, and then I started playing Half-Life 2. Uh, because you told me it was the best thing since sliced bread as it was and I got up to a I got up to a point at which I was just dying over and over again in a really out of place feeling city full of chicken headed zombies uh, and that I would just be Raven didn't like it I Ravenholm it even sounds stupid and it just <laughs> oh, sounds like shame. something out of sounds like something out of the like vampire the masquerade role-playing game oh god shane ah you see you didn't even finish half-life 2 it gets so much better with the two sequels um this was this was a time where uh so obviously shane and i differ on this and reasonable people might a lot of people loved portal that didn't like the half-life games and vice versa i think although probably i loved portal Mm -hmm. i i wasn't really sucked into the half-life games although you know i i'm not i'm not Against, you know, first person shooter is the kind of first person shooter I like. I like first person shooters where I have a plot to follow and I have to open doors, you know, myself and I have to wander through an area and find, you know, new exciting aliens to kill. All those are story driven first person shooters. And I think you might want to try this again on a computer where you can aim with a mouse rather than with a gamepad because the PS3 version, which I think is the one you played and was the first one I played before I replayed it on a computer, uh, that version was uh, troubled to say the least. Probably, you're probably right. You're probably right. Um, But that said, um, Portal was a game that, you know, I started it and I played through it the entire way on the orange box there, even though, you know, I I never found the PlayStation to be the best place to play uh, a first person shooter. But I turned around and I played that game uh, again within the year just because it was such an such an excellent game. And it was such an interesting game that um, uh, Julia, my wife, who was at the time my girlfriend, she watched me play that game beginning to end, uh, you know, trying to help me solve the puzzles. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, sort of from that, that was my very first experience with any Valve game. Uh, but, you know, these days, Valve has sprung into being such a huge company with their steam and the steam engine. And, um, so I, I think it's worth talking about kind of the legacy of this game. Yeah. Um, it, it had an incredible sequel. Um, well, before we do that, I want to talk a little bit more about the orange box itself because, okay, well, what do I not know about the orange box? Cause I mean, I skipped two thirds of the con more than two thirds of the content. Well, in it. you don't have to have played most of that to kind of see that the orange box is hugely important as a probably the first time someone cracked the nut of how to sell short games. Because that's a very good point. The the orange box bundled games before humble bundles made it cool. The orange box took three games that would all on their own have been completely unable to be sold. So Portal, it was a game that you know, if you buy too it, on, short. it's too short. It's just too short. No matter how good it was, there's no way that someone would go into a store and pay $60 or $50 or whatever the going rate was for a PS3 game at the time to buy Portal on its own. It just would never have worked out. And same thing goes for it on the Xbox. At the time, it was too large to distribute on Xbox Live. So there, you were really limited in how to distribute a game like this. They were able to sell it as a single download on the on, on PC through Steam, which had only been going for a little while at the time. Um, and they sold it for about 20 bucks. And that's a price point that we see still today. And I, and I think that that was working. But they figured out that they could sell it on consoles if it was a part of this larger bundle. Um, they also sold it with uh, Half-Life 2 Episode 2, they were experimenting with, um, and unfortunately it doesn't seem like they've continued experimenting with, episodic content, but it was a meaty part of the Half-Life saga. Uh, this was after Half-Life 2 had come out as a discrete individual game, a full-length game. Yeah. And then it Half-Life kind of... Episode 1, excuse me, Half-Life 2 Episode 1 came out 
on its own as a digital download, but most people on consoles didn't get a chance to play it because it wasn't something that people would go out and buy on its own. So they had the really smart idea to put Half-Life 2 and Half-Life 2 Episode 1, which were not new, and the new Half-Life 2 Episode 2 all on one disc, along with Portal, a new exciting game. What and was along funny was that idea was so new that it actually turned me off like when I initially heard about it because I associated uh, bundle discs with the sort of thing you had always seen before, which would have been like the crappy anthology collection from, you know, XYZ Japanese publisher who made like one good Genesis game and then re-released all the crap that they've ever done on a single disc. That's a really good point. I think apart from things like Namco Museum, this was one of the few places where I'd seen a kind of a collection or, you know, anthology, if you want to call it that, although I don't know if I quite consider it an anthology, but it was one of the first places where you'd see games bundled together in order to sort of increase the value of the whole. Uh, and, and games, all three of the games on this had great lives afterwards. Portal spawned a sequel. Um, Team Fortress 2 is still played today and is a hugely popular game. Uh, and it's become free to play, so it's continued to evolve its its sales model with the times. And uh, Half Life Two Episode Two, uh, yeah, well, it was kind of the end of the road for the Half Life Two games, but uh, it's you know, the the sequel, Half Life Two Episode Three, or which was long delayed and is still vaporware, or theoretically maybe Half Life Three, is still one of the hotly mo- most hotly anticipated, still unannounced games ever so you know it's giving last guardian a a serious run for its money in fact maybe even overshadows it in terms of most hotly anticipated vaporware i i know i never stop hearing about it on the internet i know it's kind of a joke at this point I, i wonder really what the internal conversation is about that i would be willing to bet that they've created numerous versions of the game that they've had to scrap in partially completed states for one reason or another. They must have started redeveloping Half-Life 3 over from scratch a dozen times Is it going to be like that Duke Nukem Forever that just never comes out and when it does, everybody forgets about it? Oh, I pray that it's not. I really do. Because the games were just so phenomenal. I think it would just be so sad if it actually came. It would be better for it never to come out than for it to come out and be bad. I wonder, I mean, not to get off onto another subject, but, you know, they've got these new Steam is uh, getting their own hardware and it seems like it should be a launch title for them. But well, they're not launching their own heart. Yeah, I really agree. When I heard that that Valve was launching their own gaming platform, you know, the Steam box, I was really excited that it was going to be a huge platform style launch. But no, I don't think so. Mm. I don't think it's coming out their style. Yeah. Um. But I do th- think that the the orange box as a bundle does sort of presage things like the humble bundle and even Steam sales and things like that because we see this all the time with short, sort of more uh, you know, limited games these days. Is that they're they're collected together with other games or they're sold as a download at a low price point? And Portal actually sort of pioneered both. You could buy it on Steam for twenty bucks, which was unusual at the time. Uh, and you could buy it as a part of a larger pack uh, as a bundle for a, you know, the same price as a regular game. But, oh, my gosh, you get like four. Three games. Actually, no, it wasn't even three because if you count. Really, four games. Well, five if you count all three parts of Half-Life 2. So really an amazing bargain if you came right down to it. And everybody found something to love in that orange box. It was game's yeah, best deal to date. Uh, until we started seeing <laughs> insane, perhaps maybe even too good It was an even better deal like for me because you just sort of gave me your old copy. Yeah. You were like, ah, I'm going to play this on the computer now. That's true. And I was like, oh, okay. Free game. Valve is continuing to try and experiment with weird models for selling and distributing their games. Like, for example, with uh, Portal 2, when you bought it on the PlayStation 2, you also got a Steam copy, so you could download it on your computer as well. So they're they're really one of the most innovative companies when it comes to finding ways to distribute their games and make their platform as a whole benefit from their great work on individual games. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely one of those things where 
a little before its time, but really maybe just the time was right. Mm -hmm. Portal, the time was right. It was a triumph. It was a triumph. And we didn't even talk about the closing song. Uh -huh. Oh, that's the, to me, that is what really, because I had heard at that time of Jonathan Colton. Mm -hmm. He, he is sort of a internet famous. Yeah. And even was a little bit back then. Um, but that song really just put the final polish on the whole experience of Portal. And I could still sing you that whole song, although I would, I would, uh, I'll spare you. Um, it was a game that started off sort of feeling like bleak and grim and, you know, like a, like a, literally like a rat in a maze. Uh, and the arc of the game really takes you through sort of being tormented and finding the kind of bleak humor in that situation all the way to a moment of like absolute victory and escape. And, you know, you've defeated GLaDOS, the you know, genetic life form and disc operating system. <laughs> and when you're stepping out of the uh, facility, suddenly, you know, you just sort of hear this song start to come in and, and, and you've got the beautiful, beautiful tones of, of, of what's her name? Ellen uh, McLean, who is actually yeah. a, a professional singer and a really has a beautiful voice when it's not being distorted for purposes of yeah. sounding like a computer. And, and you've got the, the songwriting of Jonathan Colton, who's a excellent, I mean, if nothing else, he's a fabulous comic songwriter. And the song was so catchy that it was just sort of it was covered by everyone on the internet. Everybody on the you internet. You couldn't throw a stone on YouTube without hitting a cover of Still Alive. Excuse me, Still Alive was the one from uh, Portal 2. Um, no, this was it, Still Alive. Oh, Still, no, I'm sorry, you're right. Um, uh, I Want You Gone is the, the, the song at the end of yeah. Portal 2. They, they tried to repeat the magic of Still Alive, and they did a really good job, but nothing is quite like that. It was, it was so unexpected, like, I didn't know that there was gonna be the song at the end. And so when I got to the end of that game and I was having that feelings of like triumph and then in you're already feeling it. And then in comes GLaDOS and she's telling you- and she serenades you, know, you and- She serenades and you, she's, she's telling you, so I'm happy. happy. I'm happy that you defeated me. You know, you, you went ahead and defeated me and tore up all my bits and threw them into a fire and and I'm happy you for you. It's such you a joyful it. moment at the end of the game. And I think that more than anything puts the cherry on the top of the game and makes it feel like such an amazing experience because you went through hell and you solved some amazing puzzles. You feel so smart playing that game. And then finally you get that wonderful moment of bliss at the end. I'm actually a little sad that they patched the game when the Portal 2 came out, just beforehand, they released a patch for Portal 1 that actually shows your uh, character, Chell, being dragged back into the facility at the end of the game after the credits. And in a way, I'm all, I know that that sort of sets up the game, the, the, the sequel, and that it's important plot-wise, and it was a very clever marketing move for them to do that because they released that before Portal 2 had ever really been formally announced. And so we all saw that happen. We thought... Why on earth did Portal, sitting here on my hard drive, get an automatic patch from Steam? And then eagle-eyed people noticed that the game had a new ending. Um, brilliant marketing. Great way to announce the game. But in a sense, I do actually feel like it would be better to keep it as it was. You have that wonderful last moment. But you still get that moment. It's just a little tag on the end of that. Mm -hmm. It just guarantees that you walk away from the game happy. Mm -hmm. Even though it is a, a game that left me... We talk a lot about, a lot about short games mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about games leaving you like ha being a complete experience in two hours, but never have I played a game and ended it wanting more as much as I did with Portal. Mm. I actually, I do agree with you. I wanted more, but I also got up from this game and felt like, gosh, that was great. The way that you do at the end of an of amazing song. book. That's because of the song. Yeah. Like that's, if it hadn't been for that song, I would have walked out into that open field and I would have been like, oh, was that it? I wanted more. But yes, it was really capped off well. So what's the, what's the 
the legacy of Portal. You know, here we are. That was released in 2007. Here we are in 2014. Um, what's uh, apart from its amazing sequel? Well, I suppose which we can spend a minute on too. What is the legacy of this game? <sighs> I mean, I don't. Th- I don't think that there's a single like indie game, even like the super common genre these days of puzzle platformers. Like, I don't think there's a single game that has puzzle elements these days that doesn't owe a little something to Portal. That's true. I've just finished playing through Tesla Grad, which was in a recent Humble Bundle and is a really great little two-dimensional go. platformer on Steam and I think also maybe on some other platformers, platforms, excuse me. Um, and playing Tesla Grad, it's a platformer. It's a 2D platformer, plain and simple, but it plays with physics in ways that you would never have seen before Portal. And it's a very different game. You've got uh, mostly playing with magnets. There's no you know teleportation involved, but it screamed Portal to me, even though it, it was in every way different, two-dimensional rather than three-dimensional, and a, uh, a beautiful art style that is in no way similar to Portal. And the puzzles were different. And the mechanics of the of the sort of key, like, physics-y stuff was all different. But it screamed Portal to me still because it was a game that had a physics, uh, physics at the core of the platforming, uh, you had a special ability that allowed you to switch things. In this case, it was magnets, switching the polarity of magnets. Um, but they even had a glow that reminded me of Portal. And every game I play these days that has a... You talked about physics. Transistor at the start of the game. Mm-hmm. And I thought, listening to that, you know, we've got, a, we've got a talking sword. Like, we've got something that's narrating through the whole course of the game. Um, you know, and that, from that developer, ties back to their first game, Bastion. But... Uh, I think that Portal might be among the first few games that I played that managed to be fully narrated yeah. by something that was very characterized. Yeah, and what an amazing thing. You see that a lot in games today now. And it's uh, in this case, that was another great choice that they had to make for budgetary reasons. This was a game on a budget where they couldn't afford to put in an Alex Vance like they had in uh, in Half-Life 2. You know, you they couldn't afford to do a realistic seeming second character for you to interact with in this game. It just wasn't possible on their budget. And so GLaDOS was a brilliant invention, another character that you never really see until the very, very end of the game. Um, And most of the story of the game, you know, your main character doesn't speak. There's no, you know, books to pick up. You know, it's not Skyrim where you can go and find a novel somewhere on a t- table and read the backstory of the world. No, almost the entire story of this game comes just from GLaDOS's monologue, essentially, and, uh, and narration. And, yeah, absolutely. And brilliant voice acting. Absolutely. And you see that same concept. It's economical. It works. And it is, it is, it's always... It's it's a, at least always a good option, and you see it used again and again to good effect. I look at games like Thomas Was Alone, which we played on a previous episode, uh, another game that bears very little relation to Portal, but in that it has a, a narrator that carries the story of the game, uh, that's something that we really hadn't seen before, uh, before the GLaDOS and the amazing stuff here. So... Absolutely. It, it has it casts a very long shadow on indie games and video games in general. It's uh, it, both with its puzzle platforming, its physics, its narration and characterization, its dark humor. It has blazed a trail that many, many others have followed and, you know, few have equaled, but but many have drawn inspiration from. Thanks so much for talking with me about this game, Shane. I know that we've both played it more than once, and I know that our listeners probably have played it, so I'm really glad I'll that... I'll probably play it again. Uh, I, I think this game, to me, uh, if nothing else, gives me something where if it, I'll know that if, if I say something like, you know, the cake is a lie, and somebody, I could t- tell in their eyes that they have recognized what I'm saying, I know that maybe they're the kind of gamer that I'm going to... I'm going to get along with this is this game is an evergreen and uh, it's it's sequel also is amazing. And I think I'm going to go play that again soon. Mm-hmm. So and that one, gosh, they had co-op 
Oh, uh, co-op. co-op. Uh, we bro up. We really ought to play the co-op of that game again someday. There's new levels now, you know. Oh, I didn't. Well, know. they'd had that whole like cooperative testing initiative, so everyone could submit levels for it, and now there's tons of them, just tons. Ace. Mm-hmm. Also, just on a total aside note, did you see uh, things about uh, thinking with Time Machine? No. There's a. Uh, it's out on Steam as a as like a downloadable thing. There's a great mod for Portal Two. Began as just a you know a mod, but now it's out on Steam. You can download it if you have Portal Two installed. Uh, called Thinking with Time Machine, and it's an add-on to Portal 2 where you play through the game not just with a portal gun, but with a time machine. And you oh. can snap back in time by several minutes. And what that means is that you're essentially playing co-op with yourself because you can play through a part of a portal level and essentially record yourself doing something and then snap back in time and play through the same level with yourself there doing everything that you did over the last few minutes in order to essentially play a portal level co-op with yourself where you uh, you can you know pick up objects and hand them to yourself or you can place portals for your future self to jump through uh, it really I haven't played it yet but I watched some video of it and it looks really appealing so you can see that this game is uh, still being is iterated on just amazing so where can people play this game Almost anywhere now, I guess. Um, you can play it on all the major consoles. You can play it on Mac, PC, Linux. You can play it on NVIDIA Shield. Uh, are there any other mobile versions of the game? Nope. It's just the NVIDIA Shield at this point. They ported it to Android, but I don't know if it's for marketing reasons or power reasons. The Shield has a very powerful GPU for a mobile device. Um uh, or maybe just because of the controls. Uh, Portal is out on Android, but only available on the NVIDIA Shield. It may be okay. possible to, you know, I don't know, side load it or something, but I, I haven't looked into it. Yeah, well... Um, Gosh darn, this game this is point, good. Yeah, it, it, I think most people that have a computer that they purchased since 2007 should be able to run it. So Yeah, um, so go to... The Steam website, steampowered.com, if you don't already have the Steam client installed. Download the Steam client. Pay them the, what is I think we could completely cost? forget about this segment of the show where we tell people how to find the game. Because seriously, seriously, everyone's played this game now, right? Yeah, everyone has already played this game. And if you I mean, we told you at the start of the show, right? Mm -hmm. So what we really should be talking about is go play Portal again. Go play it again. Go play this game again. That's one of the wonderful things about short games is if you love it, you can play it again. You know, I have so many games that I have loved and played that I just never get to play again because it's a cost. You know, you, you, the cost is if I play this game again, I won't be able to play some other game. And there's always so many amazing games coming out. But with short games like this one, you can go back and pick this game up and have great fun with it for an evening. And if you're not doing anything tonight, go play Portal again. All right, thank you so much for joining me on the show, Shane. This has been a lot of fun. I love this game so much, as you can probably hear. And um, I'm sorry Nate didn't get to, uh, to be here with us. We are not sure what our next uh, episode will be for next week, so we'll make sure that we put an well, update on the show Well, we've got a couple page. of ideas. Um, we, might we might be doing Transistor. Might be. We might be doing uh, iOS games uh, that won this year's uh, Apple Design Awards. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you what your feedback is on I'm any topics that we might want to cover. For that. Yeah, um, this year's Apple Design Awards were really game-heavy, I don't know exactly how they do that, but uh, like how they decide how many to give or what the categories are. But this year, actually, four really fascinating games won Apple Design Awards, uh, and all of them are out on iOS and some of them also on other platforms. Uh, Simogo has a really interesting game called Device 6 that we're working our way through right now, and it seems just absolutely amazing. Um, really strange. Crazy hybrid of a, of a interactive fiction and a puzzle game. Really a strange, interesting game. Um, threes an amazing puzzle game that I have been addicted to for a couple of months now and deserves every bit of praise that it gets. Uh, also, um, Leo's Fortune, which is a really cute platformer with really gorgeous visuals. I have not played that at all, and I'm not positive I'll be able to before the episode. But um, And what was the other one? Monument Valley, which we've talked about briefly on Monument the show Valley, before. Monument Valley, which is going to be Looks amazing. That's a beautiful game. Absolutely. So some combination of those is probably uh, and another game that owes soon. something to Portal. Absolutely, because it's just a great fun way to play with physics in a in a sort of a 
Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so that is a upcoming episode topic that we are uh, working towards. Maybe this next episode, maybe soon thereafter. Uh, so if you have any thoughts about games that you think we should cover or that we should play if we haven't played them, please let us know. The best way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. We are at underscore short game on Twitter. Uh, or you can find me personally on Twitter at Reagan K. I spell that a little funny. It's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K. Shane, where can they find you? They can find me at 8-Bit Shane, 8-B-I-T-S-H-A-N-E. And Reagan, we really need to have an email address for the show. Well, we do. Our email address for the show is info at theshortgame.net, or you can visit our website and there is a contact form, and that also goes to our email. So if you prefer to write a nice long message to us, please do that. You can either email us or fill out the form on the website, and we get that, and we'd love to respond to it. So uh, thanks for uh, tuning in this week. Thanks for having me on the show again, Reagan. <laughs> You're welcome, Shane. Thanks for coming on with me again, and uh, we'll be back next week, hopefully with our good friend Nate with another great episode of The Short Game. Shutting down.